And I want to welcome you all here today for the STEAM caucus's first briefing. I'm thrilled to see so much interest in this caucus. We actually had to move to a bigger room, which is quite a problem to have. So w welcome to all of you. I especially want to acknowledge my STEAM caucus co-chair, Congressman Aaron Schock from Illinois. Uh, Congressman, thank you. And, and the Rhode Island delegation, I know Congressman Langevin is on his way, and Congressman David Cicilline, who you, who you will hear from momentarily, uh, they championed the uh, le early legislative efforts to promote STEAM education here on the Hill. Uh, a special thanks to the Rhode Island School of Design, RISD, for a fantastic uh, partnership, been a national leader in STEAM. Thanks to Americans for the Arts for their support and collaboration, and of course, thank you in advance to all of our wonderful panelists here today who are going to enlighten us about why STEAM is so important to our schools and to our economy. STEAM is about innovation. STEAM recognizes the importance of STEM, but also recognizes how STEM disciplines can be enhanced through art and design. STEAM is a student at Seaside High School in Oregon who is so excited about not only building a robot, but also creating a logo for her Lego robotics team. She looked at me and said, I'm using both halves of my brain. STEAM is students at Quantama Elementary School in Hillsborough, Oregon, who are engaged in discovering the interaction between worms and soil and clay and pottery. STEAM is students ex excelling in math by learning to subdivide measures in orchestra rehearsals. STEAM is about educating creative, critical thinkers who are prepared to contribute to and, in fact, lead in an innovation economy. And uh, I want to acknowledge our staffs uh, from my office, Carly Katz, and from Congressman Schock's office, Margie Alsmana, for all your hard work on uh, getting this uh, briefing set up. Next, we're going to hear from Congressman Jim Langevin, one of the leaders uh, of STEAM on the Hill and uh, a member of the Rhode Island delegation. Welcome. Suzanne, thank you very much. And good afternoon, everyone. What a great room here today. I'm so glad you all turned out in, in force for this uh, first STEM to STEAM briefing. And uh, I just want to recognize the, the, the lineup that you have here, a great panel I see, and especially want to recognize my good friend from Rhode Island, John Maida, uh, president of Rhode Island School of Design, who, in, in, as far as I know, coined the term STEM to STEAM, and uh, something we've been kind of spreading the word from, uh, from there forward. So, uh, John, great to see you back here. But I especially, of course, want to thank and recognize uh, Suzanne, Representative Suzanne Bonamici, and and uh, Aaron Schock for taking the, uh, the time and putting the, uh, the initiative together to start the STEAM caucus. Uh, their leadership on this issue is really greatly appreciated and it's gonna make great contribution to, to moving this uh, issue forward and seeing it expand and I certainly look forward to working with them in the coming months. Uh, art and design, I believe, are integral to the innovative process and that's why I believe that we absolutely have to ensure that they are key components as we work to reauthorize the Elementary and Secondary Education Act the Higher Education Act, and also the Workforce Investment Act. Turning STEM to STEAM, uh, I believe, will help to create more jobs, while at the same time uh, adding to the skill set of, of our high school and our college graduates. Art and design advance the understanding of STEM learning and collaboration. They help to convey complex, complex uh, 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 concepts to a, a very broad audience, and. Um, and I believe that uh, in classrooms and laboratories across the country, the innovative nature uh, of art and design play an essential role in improving STEM education and uh, advancing uh, STEM research. And also, I believe, uh, helps America to maintain our competitive edge in the world. Uh, we have some just incredibly innovative products uh, in this country, and in, in many ways, it's because you see art and design coming together. Uh, as John likes to use, and I use the example all the time of who the heck bought MP3 players until the iPod came along. And, uh, and it's just a great piece of technology, but it looks really cool, and it's easy to use, and, and, um, and uh, it's exciting. So, uh, but with that, let me just say that uh, I really am so pleased that uh, uh, Congresswoman Bonamici and uh, Congressman Schock uh, have, uh, have joined me also in introducing the bipartisan STEM to STEAM resolution, uh, House Resolution uh, HRES 51, uh, which calls on Congress to take these important principles into account when considering education policy. And I hope, certainly hope that many of our colleagues will consider uh, co-sponsoring the resol resolution and becoming uh, active in the STEAM caucus. So with that, uh, STEAM, 
I believe is a strategy for investing in job creation and uh, ensuring that we have the best educated and most creative college graduates on the planet. And uh, it's uh, certainly wonderful be to be here today uh, to see such uh, an interest in STEAM. And I really do hope that we can turn this energy into policy changes in the Congress. So Suzanne, congratulations. Aaron, congratulations. Well done. Thank you very much, Congressman. Thank you. And I want to invite Congressman David Cicilline, also from Rhode Island, to give some welcoming remarks. Yes, the uh, entire congressional delegation of the state of Rhode Island is part of this caucus, <laughs> I'm proud to say. Um, I am really delighted to be here today for a number of reasons. First, to thank Suzanne and Aaron for their uh, great passion and leadership on this issue. Uh, to thank Congressman Langevin, who uh, introduced me to the whole concept of STEAM at a gathering with John uh, and was an early proponent of the importance of STEAM. And to welcome these STEAM panelists in a special um, tribute to our great president, who is my constituent. Um, actually, we share RISD in both of our districts, but he lives in my district. Um, <laughs> but uh, he, John has been a really important and visionary leader, not only for Rhode Island, but for our country and uh, all over the world, actually. So it's really great to welcome him back to Washington. Um, this, as you all know, is a really, really important uh, endeavor. Um, I, I'm reminded, I have a, a nephew who plays hockey, and so I've gotten more familiar with some of the greats in hockey, and reminded of Wayne Gretzky who said, a good hockey player plays where the puck is, a great hockey player plays where the puck is going to be. And in many ways, that's what this is all about. And I remember very clearly being at a gathering of arts educators and CEOs at Sundance, and they were talking about... Um, the kinds of employees, the CEOs that they were trying to hire, and every one of them said, you know, what we look for employees is not math and English proficiency, but people who are creative, who are problem solvers, who are entrepreneurial, and the best indicator of success in all of those skills is art and design and music. Um, and uh, it just was really stuck with me, and of course you know that from lots of research uh, since, that, uh, since I attended that meeting, that really underscore that if we're going to compete in the 21st century global economy, it, is going to, it will be through design and art and innovation and creativity and problem solving, all the things that STEAM is about. So this is a gathering which I think um, will help propel our economy really forward into the 21st century, and I, it's really a visionary gathering, and so those who have worked on this issue, this is a big deal to create this caucus in the Congress, and I <clears throat> hope it will not only gather lots of members, but really cause us to infuse this thinking in the work that we're doing in education, in community development, in you know, financing, and all the different aspects uh, that we can impact with uh, art and design. Um, we are living in a more exciting world because of the contributions of art and design in a more beautiful world, a more productive and exciting world. And uh, this will allow us, I think, to harness that as we develop public policy. So thank you. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you, Suzanne and Aaron, for your great leadership. Ben, welcome. Thank you, David. Well, we've heard uh, a lot about the benefits of STEAM already, and we're going to hear more. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, President John Maida. I just want to let you know, if you see all the members get up and leave, it's not because we're not interested, it's because they're going to call votes. So uh, that probably won't be until close to three, but I just wanted to let you know, uh, just in case. So it's my honor to introduce President John Maida. Dr. Maida currently serves as the president of Rhode Island School of Design, where he's been a leader in the STEAM movement. His work as a graphic designer, computer scientist, artist, and educator earned him the distinction of being named one of Esquire's most influential people of the 21st century. He serves on the boards of several high-tech startups and on the Davos World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on New Models of Leadership. Dr. Maida received the AIGA Medal in 2010, and he's in the permanent collection of the Museum of Modern Art. I could go on, but I'm going to turn it over to him so he can tell us more about how design can influence technology and help innovators respond to the challenges of today's complex world. Dr. Maida, thank you again for being here. Look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. I'm a person who takes notes because I like to study, but I want to take note of Representative Bonamici's point about how STEAM acknowledges the importance of STEM. That's very important to note. It isn't a either or, it's an and. It's critical. And furthermore, this kind of both side of brain approach enables companies to prosper in so many ways, like Intel and Nike, places like that. 
Representative Shock's point about uh, creative thinking serves business in important ways. He gave the caterpillar blowing example. People don't connect art and design to economic progress, but it's connected naturally. Representative Langevin's point about art and designs are integral to innovation. You know, you, know, you can innovate, but you have to innovate in a creative way. Art and design serve that. And Representative, Representative Cicilline, we're looking for people that are, that are creative and entrepreneurial. Everyone's saying that, but can't find them. And I want to, uh, before I go into remarks, I want to introduce uh, our board vice chair, Lisa pavroff Cohn, who champions RISD's causes nationally and globally. Uh, she is an artist. She is a cultural advocate for art in so many ways. Welcome, Lisa. Oh my god, there's so many people here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here today. Um, STEM to STEAM is so important, uh, and I'm here in several roles. First of all, as vice chair of the RISD board, I'm passionate about RISD and advocating for arts education because my second role or hat is that I am a RISD alumna as well. And to Congressman Schock, um, I actually majored in basket weaving, pretty much. <laughs> so I can attest that it's actually a useful skill. Um, you know, and as a person who grew up as an artist in, um, in Ohio, I spent a lot of time in the art rooms and I really learned firsthand how creative thinking enhanced my ability to problem solve in areas like math and chemistry, which Normally, you wouldn't think a girl who's in the art department painting and with pink hair would have any interest in. And actually, I did very well in those things because I really learned to think outside the box through my uh, work in art. Um, and my third hat here, I really feel, is as a parent. I have three children who have really had the benefit of arts education, not only at home. Um, my favorite story is my middle daughter in fourth grade had to make a project with only things she found in the house. And so when she brought this thing in that she had built that had glitter and pom-poms and all kinds of really fabulous um, textiles and textural things on it, the teacher said to her, we told you you can't buy any supplies for this project. And she said, my mom had all this stuff in the cupboard. <laughs> and <laughs> they were like, okay, so you have a very crazy mother. Um, but they've been fortunate enough to go to schools where arts education is thoroughly integrated into their curriculum. And I have seen how it really does enhance their thinking. And it also is a refuge. And for a child having a bad day or no place to go after school or anything going on, they can go into the art room, they can throw a pot, they can make a painting, they can draw, they can write in a journal. And it really helps to express themselves, to kind of sort through the teenage angst of high school and college and find out who they are. So it would make me very sad not to see that for children who aren't as fortunate as mine. And I think that when we think about public education, the art is absolutely critical and essential to shaping minds and making, creating students who are really citizens of the world, understanding history through art, understanding what math and science bring to art, what art brings to those disciplines, um, and having those curriculums at their fingertips. So I hope that you will all join us in this effort and that you join me in thinking how important all of this is and um, help John Maeda, our fabulous champion, turn STEM into STEAM. So um, I'm going to turn it back to him as a designer, technologist, and leader. He personifies the concept. John. Thank you, Lisa. You know, it's interesting when you listen to all the parts of all the things that are happening around us, and um, uh, I heard the word esteemed panel, and esteemed, you know? <laughs> so uh, it's everywhere, I guess. And uh, thank you, Lisa, for your wonderful comments as a mother as well. As I'm a father, I have kids, we wonder what's going to happen in their future. Art is integral. And who knows it better than our esteemed panelists? I want to introduce them briefly. Uh, Trevor Bailey. Trevor? Trevor Bailey heads Adobe Education Worldwide. He is responsible for putting technology in classrooms so that students have access to a more productive learning environment. Adobe, we know Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Illustrator, would drive desktop publishing revolution. Uh, they, make, they made computers into something human for the first time for many of us. Eric Siegel is responsible for all programming and content development for the amazing New York Hall of Science. I say amazing with a capital A because it is remarkable. 
Uh, the, the NYHS is a hands-on science and technology center built on site of the 1964 World's Fair. Who's been to it before, please? Yeah, please go back. Um, we have Mr. Bill O'Brien. Bill O'Brien is a senior advisor for the National Endowment of the Arts, focused on exploring innovation and emerging practices in the arts. Uh, Bill is an early initiator of STEAM. He was there from the beginning. He has been knitting together partnerships with places like the, like the National Science Foundation. Uh, Bill, welcome. Thank you. Uh, and Joyce Ward, who heads education for the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Uh, she joins us via an odd, odd sort of happening at Davos. I was at Davos. I was talking to Mr. Kapos, the head of that, and he says he, like, he likes STEAM, how to get involved, and just lo and behold, pop. <laughs> welcome. Welcome. Welcome, Joyce. Um, that's pretty amazing. Government is agile, you see, it moves. Um, so, uh, first of all, I want to um, begin with uh, a few thoughts about STEAM. Um, so, everyone knows RISD, it's a pretty amazing art school. We produce people like Seth MacFarlane, who's hosting the Academy Awards, anything from Gus Van Sant, uh, Goodwill Hunting, you just look around the room and you'll find things that are, have some RISD sort of fairy magic dust on them. Um, and uh, of all places, how did MIT graduate end up at RISD is an interesting question for me every day. Uh, but it comes back to a question that actually I had as a, as a child. Uh, I was in third grade and um, you know, uh, I, my father uh, uh, and mother went to the uh, parent-teacher conference and my my father doesn't really get out of the house much. He's always, always working at the tofu factory in Chinatown. And, but he wanted to come. He wanted to see. So parent-teacher conference happens, and the um, teacher says, you know, John is good at math and art. And so my dad said, huh. The next day he was talking to his friend. He said to his friend, you know, John's good at math. <laughs> and, and why is it is the whole question I keep asking, and because I was good at math, I went to MIT, and what I did after MIT is go to art school and make things for places like Chanel or Google and design for these kinds of clients. But it was because I was trying to combine together uh, art and math together, kind of a STEAM approach. Now, I'm sure you all saw the uh, recent State of the Union speech, and in that speech you could hear the power of STEM STEM as a way to change the economic doldrums to pick it all up, and we all know that. Technology is a powerful thing. But we also have to ask, how do we make it even better? Um, and if anything, America has always turned to not just technology, but it's also turned to design. We talk about manufacturing. Think back to the early 1900s. Stuff was made, but nobody really wanted it because it was just technology. It was just manufactured. But until designers from the Bauhaus entered the bloodstream, we began to make things that people want, that are human, and frankly interesting. Look to the car industry, the story there, Detroit. Um, everyone can make a car. Henry Ford could make a car. It was a car that was black, and it was very simple, and he didn't want to make any design variations on it. And in the end, that got hard. Design differentiated, made cars more accessible, made them more interesting, gave them a human vocabulary. Art and design do that all the time. Example, the Apple, Apple iPod, the MP3 players you were bringing up. We had MP3 players, digital audio players. Nobody really wanted them because they were technology. But then they became humanized, design. We wanted them. We wanted to live with them. Um, you know that the hotel industry, who, everyone, everyone here has probably seen a hotel perhaps, hotel, motel. We have this notion of how the industry works. But it turns out that um, a designer from RISD has founded a company called Airbnb which is now a $5 billion valued company in Silicon Valley. How do designers make that? How do they make a new business model where you can rent out your couch now using this website? Using design as transformative, as inventive. Sciences are changing, and they want to change even faster for discovery. This is a picture of Dr. David Ho. He was in the Time 100 list. He's an AIDS researcher. And I was struck by how Dr. Ho is using a clay model instead of the regular stick and ball molecule model, he's trying to discover, he's going off-road. And scientists want to go off-road. They want to go into different places. And that's why the National Science Foundation collaboration occurred, to sort of find out how, what we can learn from artists and designers to innovate and invent. And since steam has been kind of rising, another sort of metaphor, um, uh, everyone's, uh, everyone's sort of th talking about how steam can make the country even better, not just our country too, but the entire world. It's a, it's a flutter on Twitter. Uh, many people, are partners are coming on board, and it's so exciting. 
Uh, we also have something called the Meharam STEAM Fellows Program. It's, uh, it funds uh, 10 RISD students to work in not-for-profit sector, uh, NGOs, government offices. Uh, we had one work at the National Defense University for DOD, one work for Mayo Clinic, and so we have a program. If you have an office in Washington looking for interns that will work for free, we have them. Um, I want to close with a thought. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had two speakers on campus. We had Harry Belafonte for our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speech, and we had um, Jack Dorsey. And I thought it was important because Harry represents art transformation, the civil rights movement, that sort of part makes you feel and sing. And Jack Dorsey represents the new wave of technology. And these two parts coming together at RISD would seem so unlikely, but it is now a common thing. And this room is testament to that. And uh, boy, it's exciting. So I want to um, now move on to my uh, fellow panelists and start us off. Thank you. <laughs> Trevor. So, appreciate being here. Kind of a rough group to follow, though. Um, I will say, uh, I come from Silicon Valley, and in Silicon Valley, there is no greater place where art and technology really <clears throat> meet. Um, how many people have a smartphone? Pretty much everybody in the room. If you remember the first smartphones that came out, they weren't very smart, were they? And they weren't very user-friendly. So, you've heard a lot about design, right? Well, those things were designed by engineers, right? The design of them was clunky. I mean, the first cell phone, if you remember the first cell phone, you had a big like, thing on the side with a cord and everything else. And there was some engineer that was extremely proud of that, but there was a lot of users that were really upset about it, <laughs> right? And so they have migrated that. They actually realized, you know, we need to bring some design in. We need to bring some art into the actual model, right? And what came out of it was a very user-friendly interface a, a form factor that was easy to use, right? So there, there's always a melding of technology and art, and people don't really realize that. And it also happens in other areas. It's not just in technology, your packaging, right? Somebody's gotta design that packaging. Somebody wants to make sure that it looks nice, right? Your marketing materials. Somebody's gotta design those marketing materials. Somebody has to be artistic enough to put it together, right? So you think about business, and when you think about business, you know, finance pops up. Um, you know, making money, revenues, and things like that. But there's a whole engine at companies that actually drive that forward, right? I, being at Adobe, I know that more than, than anybody. We're, we're always, you know, trying to drive our business forward. But we do that in new and creative ways. Um, so one of the things, being a company that is really, really interested in creativity as a whole, because that's really the constituency that we serve, we, we've done a little research. And we did two research projects. The first research project, we went out um, worldwide to... 5,000 people, 1,000 people in the U.S., Germany, Japan, um, and uh, U.S., Germany, Japan, uh, the U.K., and um, the Netherlands. And we asked them, we said, you know, tell us a little bit about creativity. Tell us what you think, you know, is, is the state of creativity. And what we found was astonishing, right? So that first study revealed that about 80% of people actually feel that unlocking creativity is critical to economic growth. Right? 80%. Two-thirds felt that creativity was essential to society. 62% felt that their current education structure was stifling creativity. 62%. Right? Now, creativity, I just mentioned, is what drives the economy, what drives companies, what drives marketing, what drives revenue. Without creativity then, and if it's stifling at the education, we're producing a bunch of students that are gonna come out that are gonna be automatons that are not going to be creative. Right? And I was thinking about that the other night because I was at dinner, everybody has mentioned that they have kids. I, I have a three-year-old son. And the first thing that he got um, was his kid's menu and some crayons, <laughs> right? And so he you know, draws a little picture and, and granted it looked nothing like a bear and it was green, right? But he's like, Bear, right? And I'm like, that's fantastic. That was great, right? I mean, so he already wants to be creative. He already wants to exude that. And I was thinking, you know, how horrible it's going to be if he gets to an education where that is not part of the curriculum, right? What's interesting in this study is 88%, and it's not on this slide, but 88% of respondents felt that creativity needs to be incorporated into the curricula. 
right? 88%. Americans feel that they are the most creative nation, right? Um, and you know what? I, I believe it. We are a creative society. However, only 25% of respondents felt that they ever had a chance to be creative at work, right? And that's sad, right? Creativity and invention is what drives this country forward, what makes the economy great. And without it, you know, maybe that's part of the reason why we're running into an economic malaise. Maybe that's part of the reason why we, we're having some difficulty now. Maybe because we've lost focus on that aspect. So in the second study that we did, um, we went out just to the U.S., interviewed 1,000 more folks, um, very education-centric in nature. What we found out was 70% of college-educated people thought that creative thinking should be taught as a course, right? Now, what's interesting about this is part of the people that responded to this, um, they all had to be college graduates. They were all 25 years of age or older. They were all working. Um, but there was a good amount of respondents that were um, biologists or in biosciences. And usually, any time I talk to a bioengineer or a bioscientist, you know, their answer to everything is, it's genetics. It's genetics, right? But the weird thing about creativity and the weird thing we found out with this study, that an overwhelming percentage, I think it was about 75% of them, actually felt that creativity could be taught in the classroom, right? So that says a lot. I'm not saying that people, you know, aren't born with creative gifts. I'm, I've got a brother who, you know, you ask him to draw anything and, and he can make it look realistic. You know, conversely with me, you ask me to draw anything and it looks more like a green bear. Um, but, but the truth is, you know, there, there's a, a real need out there. 85% um, agree that creative thinking is critical to problem solving. Um, something to highlight, 78% feel that it's critical for their job, right? And the real kicker here and the thing that you need to see at the very bottom is the list of disciplines that people felt in the study that were important to drive creative thinking, right? Art, number one. Music, number two. Drama's right up there. But there's also a correlation between science and math, right? So I don't think it's anything all of itself. I don't think it's just science is the answer. I don't think math is the answer. I honestly believe that the melding of all of these is what really drives creative thought and the creative process forward. Right? And I see it every day. I see it in my job. I see it with my coworkers. I see it in the products that my company builds. Right? It's a melding of science, technology, math, art. Right? And I think it's really important. Other things that, that I'd like to highlight is um, there are several studies that have been done recently. One was from the Grunwald Institute, where in Florida, they've got career and technical education programs. And they gathered a lot of data. And the way they structured their programs is at the end of the program, you need to take a certification. They're driving certifications. Art and design happens to be a large portion of what they're teaching. And they teach it from a technology perspective, right? Well, the Grunewald Institute has found a definite correlation between technology courses and graduation as well as GPA. In fact, the GPA of students that are enrolled in these courses actually is higher than the students that are not enrolled in these courses. And the correlation with that is not so much from the course itself, because the course is a pass-fail course. So that means it has no impact on their GPA whatsoever. What they're finding is the fact that you're getting students involved in something that they feel passionate about, that they want to be involved in, that drives them to do better in the rest of their studies, whether it's English, whether it's math, whether it's a science course. It also means that they attend school more often. In fact, the study found that they attend, um, I think it's like 62 days more than the regular student. It was something crazy, right? And the reason for that is because they're interested. They're engaged, right? Art is a way to get folks engaged. Art is a way to create that creativity bond, right? Art gets people excited, brings them to class, right? There's also things that we've seen with a, a foundation called Global Aurea. Global Aurea actually goes into schools and they teach kids how to create games. And these games might be STEM in nature, how, you know, a math game, right? But the actual creativity process is part of what they do. So you have to have the artwork that goes into the game, you have to have you know, the content that goes into the game, and then you have to put it all together and, and have the coding. So it's a, it's a mishmash of technology and the art. And it's really kind of interesting what you could see some of these kids come up with much better than a green bear, I'll tell you that. So 
Um, at Adobe, we also have the Adobe Youth Voices Program. And the Adobe Youth Voices Program goes into underprivileged school districts, gives them technology, and what we're seeing is a tremendous turnaround in some of these areas, right? And we do it worldwide. Um, and, and I ask each of you if you have time to go and visit the site because there are some really compelling videos. There's, there's a video that was put together by some deaf girls and it was called, We're Deaf Not Dumb. And it was their way to actually use the arts to express themselves, to talk about you know, the, the challenges that they have on a day-to-day -day basis. And the only way they could communicate that was through a video. And the only way that they could actually get that done was having access to the tools to make the art happen. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Eric. No have it. Thank you, Trevor. Thank you. Eric, go ahead. Uh, I think it was Edward Tufte who said, power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. <laughs> so give me a second here. And here's my templates. Which I don't need. Okay. I'm Eric Siegel. I'm the director and chief content officer. You can salute now if you'd like. Uh, the New York Hall of Science, uh, which is in the old World's Fairgrounds in, in Queens. Um, and I'm curious, you know, so we're an interactive science center. We're all about interacting with our audience, and here we up here talking to you. Um, and I'd like to know how many of you identify as artists? Wow, that's amazing. How many of you are here representing groups that are about arts education or design education? Okay, I get it. Great. Okay, that's good to know. Um, all right, so we're a science organization. Um, and, uh, and actually... <laughs> Um, I actually, I, I couldn't agree more, and for reasons that I'll go into, that this is not an either-or situation, uh, and you'll see the strategies that the New York Hall of Science are taking to incorporate what we call design thinking into STEM learning, or is what I'm principally going to talk about here. Um, I myself, uh, I'm not a science person, I'm, uh, I was trained as a musician, and one of the things that I find is missing in the conversations about why the arts are important in science is, how many of you are musicians? Right, our, our, the, the, our congressman who was a euphonium player, right? God bless his persistence. I mean, you know, you, you have to be incredibly persistent um, to be a musician. You learn, you've heard this quality called grit, right? You learn grit when you're a musician. You know, at first you sound terrible. And as you work at it, you sound better and better. And that's true of the arts, too. So creativity isn't something that you sort of walk on, stumble on. It's something you work hard at. And schools like RISD are sort of premier at understanding how you encourage people to do that. We're kind of the feeder side of RISD. Um, we like to think that our students are the people who are going to go on to Media Lab, are going to go on to RISD, are going to go and do go on to schools like Cooper, Cooper Union. Um, and I'm going to talk about an overall strategy that we have called Design Make Play. And am I, am I in the whole thing here? Yeah. Um, and this is kind of the heart of our work nowadays. Um, as I mentioned, we're in Queens, New York, which is the most ethnically diverse county in the United States. And I think that means it's the most ethnically diverse county in the world. And I know that means it's the most ethnically diverse county in the known universe. And we're science people. Um, we have, we have um, known universe. Uh, we have, 400, we have 450,000 visitors. Um, and uh, each year, so we have a large group of visitors, and they largely reflect the diversity of the community that we're in. Um, this strategy called Design Make Play uh, is, is actually going to be the heart of a book that we're coming out with in January. I have a preprint um, announcement of the book over there. If anybody's interested, it's going to be published by Rutledge Press and um, edited by our CEO, Margaret Honey. Uh, we are one of the nation's foremost interactive science centers, um, and I won't read all the rest of the things there. Uh, and the, one of the things that's amazing about my work, um, the, the environment in which I work, not my work personally, um, is that we have the flexibility to experiment with new approaches to learning. And it's, it's, it's great to hear that people believe teaching creativity is important, um, and I would... I def I don't, I've not yet to meet the educator who claims that they understand how to do that. So part of our role is to experiment with new ways to engage young children, particularly our, the group, the bulk of our, our, our visitorship is a bell curve between kind of 8 and 12 years old. Um, and because 
because our visitors come of their own volition, um, we have the added requirement of making sure they're interested, right? It's not a school where you have to stay there. So we really are we're forced to approach as many, take as many different approaches to engaging young people as we possibly can. Um, we have exhibitions, we have workshops, we have programs. And one of our big, and, and, and one of our um, sort of things that surprised us all was Bjork. Um, Bjork uh, was, wanted to come to the United States. She got interested in science, um, and she got interested in biology. And she wanted to, uh, she did a huge new composition uh, called Biophilia, and she premiered it at the New York Hall of Science. And it was stunning. Uh, and it was stunning not only because the music is stunning, but it was stunning because of the work and care that she'd put into it. And I want to emphasize this. You know, the one thing that creative people who are serious about their work share with scientists who are serious about their work is they put a huge amount of care and attention to the details. It's a lot of work for the love of it. And Bjork was just stunning that way. Um, she did workshops for kids uh, in, the, in, the, in the area where she used apps that she and some other artists had created, uh, and, um, and she's been doing that around the world now, though I don't think she's done it again in the United States. Um, the other thing that was kind of another sort of mind blower for us was World Maker Fair. How many of you have been to a Maker Fair? How many of you know what Maker Fair is? Okay, I'll do a quick summary. Picture a state fair, right? No pigs, no cows, <laughs> but robots, <laughs> okay? Um, and so you have hundreds of thousands, 50,000, in the case of the one in San Mateo where it started, 100,000 people show up at the state fairgrounds in a weekend. And, and, um, what they, and what they encounter is hundreds of artists and designers sharing their passion about their work, whether it's weaving or robotics or Arduino circuit boards or LEDs or musical instruments. It kind of, the more fanciful, the better. Um, this is, it really is revelatory. If any of you, there are more and more of these springing up around the country. I, I encourage you to look up Maker Fair, just Google it. Um, the, the amount of creativity that's unleashed in communities like actually Rhode Island has a great, uh, has a great one, um, Providence, and uh, that's unleashed through these maker fairs is really stunning. So they, we had this year, we started three years ago, 15,000 people came in one weekend. This past year, this past September, 60,000 people came in one weekend. So it kind of blew us out of the water how much, what hunger there is for this kind of cr connection of creativity and technology. So... We decided to make a makerspace, and we actually used uh, some young artists, designers from Brooklyn, uh, built this space for us, as you can see over here on the right, um, and it has been tremendously popular. We have 3D printers in there. We have laser cutters in there. We have hammers and nails in there. We're not biased towards things that only work with computers, um, <coughs> and this has been a huge attraction for our visitors. As a matter of fact, it's become the heart of an 8,000-square-foot uh, exhibition space that we're opening in uh, March 2014, which once seemed like a long time from now, but it's coming right up. And uh, this is going to be a three, two, five million dollar space, eight thousand square feet, um, and it's all, it's going to be all about building and designing. So if you go to a museum, typically there are exhibitions that you look at. If you come to the New York Hall of Science in 18 months, what you'll be doing is you'll be doing design activities on the exhibit floor with young people facilitating these activities with you. Um, this is a huge transformation for us, uh, and it's going to entirely change the nature of how we deal with schools because we'll doing a, be doing a lot more design work with schools um, as well as in the museum. And we're also creating a whole suite of digital applications that connect this experience um, at the museum with schools, uh, and we're working with a lot of artists to do that. So our whole world is kind of infused with artists right now. Um, Last year, just closing in January, we did a, the largest, I think, um, art and science exhibition ever done in a science center. Uh, we commissioned 11 new pieces um, from artists uh, around the world. And uh, it, was, it was a real gamble on our part. Um, there were some foundations who were willing to help us with this gamble. Um, and this was a full-bore contemporary art exhibition uh, that tried to bring together art and science around the topic of sustainability. And it brought in new audiences and it uh, engaged us with new makers and new creators. And so now, again, as our, our museum is building relationships with designers and artists, and we're working with them more and more. Oh, and the catalog, actually, the catalog, which is a full-board catalog, is here. And if we run out of them here, anybody would like one, 
I'd be glad to give the one. And uh, there's a, you can get them online, and I'll give you the URL if we run out. And the reason we're doing this is because it's fun. Um, the reason we're doing this is uh, to address some of the some of the issues that that have been mentioned before. You know, this this graph uh, is a is a projection of what kind of skills are going to be needed in the workforce. Where are the growth in skills and the, and you know conspicuously the growth in skills are non routine tasks are tasks that require uh, not just training on how to do that task, but in, in training and how to take what you already know and apply it to new tasks. Um, and I also want to want to expand the thinking about uh, design, um, not only to include sort of bench scientists and people who make gadgets, um, but also people who are thinking about things like sustainability, and thinking about things how, how our thinking about things that define how our cities work, urban planners. Um, a lot of the really most pressing issues that we deal with are going to be dealt with by people who have a training in thinking about design in the broadest sense, and people that RISD is training. So I'm grateful to be here. Um, all these young people are grateful to be at the museum. And thank you for pulling this all together. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. And now Bill. Just, take just a second. Sorry. Uh, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce a colleague who's joined us, Representative Susan Davis from California, who serves with me on the House uh, Education and Workforce Committee. So I wanted to acknowledge Susan. Thank you for joining us. Hi, um, my name is Bill O'Brien. I'm the Senior Advisor for Program Innovation at the National Endowment for the Arts. And first, I'd like to thank um, Representatives Baramici, Schock, uh, Cicilline, and Langevin, um, now Davis, for uh, helping to, to shine a flashlight on this uh, conversation, which we think is very important. Uh, also, thanks to John and everybody from RISD for helping to pull it together. The founding legislation for the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities stressed that an advanced civilization is fed by all great branches of learning, and that in order to thrive, the arts and humanities must be supported alongside science and technology. At an Arizona State University convening last fall called Are We Losing Our Humanity, Deputy Director of the National Science Foundation, Dr. Cora Merritt, echoed this theme when she pointed out that activities supported by NSF, NEH, and the NEA are all concerned with the acquisition of knowledge, and that matters involving the human condition involve branches of learning that transcends all the disciplines. A few months earlier, at the Transcending Borders event hosted by the Austrian Embassy, the National Endowment for the Arts then Senior Deputy and current Acting Chair Joan Shigakawa said, we live in an age where the divide between art and science is narrowing and suggested perhaps they're simply reconvening. Throughout history, humankind's best and brightest minds, from Aristotle through Leonardo, Einstein, and Jobs, have all gazed across the disciplines to create new art forms, invent new technologies, and establish groundbreaking new scientific theories. In the last few years, we've witnessed a growing trend of vibrant activity taking place at the intersection of these fields. In a number of workshops and summits convened since 2010, the NEA, NSF, and NEH have gathered together leaders from across cultural, scientific, and technological fields to examine issues of shared concern. The opportunity to create an engine of innovation by establishing more effective networks for people working at the intersection of these fields and by infusing the arts and creativity into STEM learning have been among the key issues raised most frequently throughout these conversations. The first convening was hosted by the NEA and NSF in 2010, John referenced it earlier, uh, at a summit called Strategies for Arts plus Science plus Technology Research. The meeting brought together 55 thought leaders and stakeholders from the arts, engineering, computer science to explore challenges and opportunities facing cross-disciplinary efforts to address the biggest challenges of our day. The convening was the first federally sponsored art and science summit of its kind, and it spawned a series of at least five subsequent convenings funded by NSF that continued those investigations, STEM to STEAM at RISD being one of them. Additional cross-agency art and science convenings have also taken place during this time, such as Symbiotic Art, supported by the NEA and NSF, 
and new media systems at UC Santa Cruz, supported by NEA, NSF, and NEH. And this May, the Network of Science, Education, Arts, and Design, or SEED, uh, which developed directly out of the Initial Research Summit of 2010, will be presenting an overview of over 150 white papers that focus on these transdisciplinary themes at a public event hosted by the National Academy of Sciences. The rationale for bringing interdisciplinary approaches to learning and workforce development received a boost from the National Research Council in 2012 report entitled, Education for Life and Work, Developing Transferring Knowledge and Skills for the 21st Century, as well as a separate report, report from the conference board that was called Ready to Innovate. These publications have demonstrated that the fields of science and industry have recognized the need to foster creativity and innovation in education and in the, workplace, in the workplace to secure a strong, vibrant 21st century economy. We heard these themes echoed earlier by uh, Congressman Schock. Internally, the NEA has aggressively supported the expansion of new art forms since its inception in 1965. In the last few years, the agency has beefed up its efforts to promote discourse and targeted support around vibrant activity taking place at the intersection of art and science. The agency has recently enhanced its art and science outreach efforts, which has resulted in an increased number of applications coming in for support from the agency. And we've also made significant guideline changes in our media, presenting arts education and other disciplines that has allowed us to better embrace and encourage arts creation, expression and engagement practices that are spurred on by new technologies and shifting cultural practice. In the last two years, a number of new federal partnerships have also been established that have advanced our ability to forward research and understanding of how the arts can impact arts, health, and well-being. In 2011, then Chairman Rocco Landisman from the NEA and Secretary Kathleen Sebelius from HHS spearheaded the NEA Interagency Task Force on the Arts and Human Development. This is an alliance of 14 federal agencies and departments that periodically host workshops and public webinars to share compelling research practices and funding opportunities for research in the arts and human development. A formal partnership has also been established between the NEA and the Department of Defense uh, to support therapeutic writing, music therapy interventions, and other arts engagement opportunities at the National Intrepid Center of Excellence and the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda. The project includes an assessment component and research working group charged with developing an evaluation plan and research protocols that can measure the efficacy of arts interventions to help heal wounded service members who are addressing traumatic brain injury and psychological health issues. The great American scientist E.O. E. O. Wilson wrote that neither science nor the arts can be complete without combining their separate strengths. Science needs the intuition and metaphorical power of the arts, and the arts needs the fresh blood of science. In today's world, when technologies, economies, and cultural behavior are being disrupted and replaced, the need to combine these strengths has, inten has intensified to equip us with a deeper contextual understanding of how emerging capabilities from across the arts and sciences can enhance our efforts to advance culture, knowledge, and prosperity. By convening transdisciplinary conversations, establishing interagency partnerships, and targeting support for art and science projects and our own core funding, the NEA has been active in supporting creativity and imagination across multiple branches of learning. The goals of these efforts are to promote the development of skills necessary for success in the future, promote new cultural practice, and invest in ways that the arts can improve health and well-being across the lifespan for all of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. And before I introduce my next speaker, I want to recognize Moira Lenahan from Senator Jack Reed's office. Moira, where are you? Thank you. Welcome. Uh, next up, we have Joyce Ward. Please. <laughs> I, I also wanted to acknowledge that thank you for the, from the NEA. We also have Andrew Simon here from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So thank you, Andrew, for attending. <laughs> and, the National, okay, and the National Science Foundation is here, too. Wonderful. We're, we're broadly represented. Thank you very much. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Joyce Ward. I'm the director of the Office of Education and Outreach at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. And we are absolutely thrilled to be here today to help uh, gather steam 
uh, as we uh, as we move from STEM to STEAM and incorporate. I, I really like what uh, John said about STEM and STEAM and incorporating those together because it's really not an or. It's an and. It's a both. It's all together collaborative. That's how we um, advance. I want to uh, first thank uh, Congress uh, Person Bonamici and also uh, Representative Shock and Langevin and also uh, Cecilina and also Congressperson Davis for being here as well uh, and want to thank RISD for providing us with this opportunity. Uh, I, with the, education, with the Office of Education and Outreach in, at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, it is a new but old initiative. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has been engaging for a very, very long time in, the, in promoting the progress of science and the useful arts. Uh, and, uh, but you don't have to go all the way back to Article 1 and Section 8 to find out why the USPTO is so interested in making sure that we are encouraging more innovation and more invention in this, in this country. Um, certainly, uh, over the years, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has engaged in a number of projects related to creative thinking. Uh, there was a Project Excel, which uh, engaged with the Inventive Thinking Association, and it pushed the curriculum out to all, uh, to all states to encourage students to get involved and interested and to start thinking and utilizing creative thinking skills. We feel like that is something that we really need to encourage. And partially, it's a little bit selfish in the sense that we are the Patent and Trademark Office, and our primary business is to, uh, regis to register trademarks and to issue patents. But it's also for looking at uh, developing not only a future workforce for our office, but thinking about the needs of the country and figuring out how we get more students engaged and involved. Now, as I said, at the USPTO, we've spent a long time thinking about uh, how science and art intersect, because that is, again, the lifeblood of the agency, uh, whether it's uh, utility inventions, whether it's design, whether it's the role of trademarks to identify source uh, and the, the re to identify the source of products. All of those things converge at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. It was uh, very interesting when we first started working uh, with some of the STEM groups. Initially, people said, well, why is the USPTO here? Uh, because they didn't think of the USPTO as a science agency or as a STEM agency. But in reality, over 85% of the people who work at the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office are scientists and engineers. So we definitely depend on STEM um, for our workforce. And then you can imagine that a number of people who file those patent applications are also uh, involved with STEM. And a great number of them, an ex extraordinary number of them, are involved in art and design. Uh, and you see that with the design patents, people automatically think about the design patents, I think, and then they also think in terms of trademarks. Because design, you're actually looking at how the object actually looks and appears. So that definitely directly involves art and design. But then with trademarks, you're thinking about the packaging. You're thinking about all of those other things that go into play as well. So again, STEM, STEAM is critical to uh, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. I want to tell you a little bit about um, a few projects that we've been working on at USPTO that are seeking to draw more attention to uh, the need to integrate uh, steam, to, to integrate steam, or to incorporate steam. Uh, the first one is a project that we're working on with the National Science Foundation. I'm going to show you a short clip of that towards the end of the presentation. Um, it's uh, funny because it actually will give a visual for the Maker Fair. <laughs> but we didn't plan this at all. But um, the Maker Fair is actually featured in there um, with 3D printing. But the project is actually with the National Science Foundation. It is called the Science of Innovation. And it was really interesting because as we were working on this project, certainly it's a science of innovation. And as you can imagine, because it's USPTO and NSF, we were trying to find a way to highlight researchers and inventors who have benefited from the National Science Foundation, but also trying to find people who have patents or who have trademarks, primarily patents, uh, to see how those two things work together. But along the way, we had to figure out how do we define innovation? There are a million definitions out there of innovation. And what we were trying to do is figure out, well, how can you distill that 
into a few words because you've only got a few seconds to get that point apart, that point across. How do you do that? And so the words that uh, we came up with for that opening are imagine, invent, improve, and inspire. And imagine. When you, you can't even say imagine without starting to imagine, without thinking about the visual representation, without thinking of all of the different things that imagine encompasses. That says to, to us, and we hope it says to other people, that you really have to start there. We really have to think about how we get our students thinking about how they can visualize, how they can imagine, how they can tie those basic concepts together. Because if you don't have that imagination, it's hard to get to the point of, creation. It's hard to get to that point of inventing or improving and let alone inspiring. And so that process just really for us drove home the point that you really, you, you can't do it without imagination. Art is in there. Art and design is in there. We have to get our students started thinking about how they actually implement. Uh, Congressman uh, Schock mentioned that some students may not necessarily gravitate towards STEM or they might not see the, the, the interest or the relevance. And he suggested that perhaps you bring art in to make it more interesting and more engaging for students. And I can tell you that from the education and outreach programs that we hosted at the USPTO and that we've worked with students on, we definitely have seen that when you get students out there, when you get them engaged in hands-on activities where they can see how this process works, they can visualize it, it makes a huge difference and a huge impact in the way that, that you're able to view few things. And just to give one example, um, one of the programs that we do is National Engineering Week. And last year we did a program uh, where we brought students in. They used first, they used, sorry, they used Lego robots, Lego Mindstorm robots to navigate a path to the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, of course, because it has to tie to intellectual property. But the, st <laughs> the students came in and they were students from underrepresented, underserved areas within the Washington, D.C. and Virginia um, area. They came in, they not had necessarily the, the experience or the exposure to working with Lego robots. So they built a robot. They had to learn to program it to navigate this course to the USPTO. Uh, and then they had to do a presentation about what they had accomplished and what they learned along the way. So the path, the beginning of the path, after they built this robot, you actually had to go and you had to pick up an idea. <laughs> you had to actually visualize that and then move on to the next step. Um, in the process. But what we found was that there were a couple of groups, or, or one in particular, there was this one young lady who the entire time was on her phone, on her smartphone, and we thought, wow, she's, she's not really interested in this. She's not really paying attention. And it was only at the end, when it was time for the presentations, we saw what this young lady was doing, which was just this absolutely amazing presentation where she had captured the process her teammates, because she had captured some of the angles, were able to figure out how to navigate their path to the USPTO. And you see how a team can make a huge difference. You need people in the arts, you need people in design, you need people with that basic STEM knowledge. But it was the collaboration that made the difference. And so often I think that that, that is the key that we really need to focus on is just that collaborative effort and what other people are able to see. Um, a few other projects that we're working on include projects with Girl Scouts, uh, working on um, an innovation um, intellectual property badge that, again, ties into the New York Hall of Science and some of the work that's going on with mentoring, <laughs> as well as uh, working with students to help them visualize concepts. It's a gathering for inventors, tinkerers, and do-it-yourselfers of all ages. You can make almost anything. If it fits in this box, you can make it. At the 2012 Maker Faire in New York City, attendees not only had the opportunity to build things, they also had the chance to experience an innovative way of making things called additive manufacturing, or 3D printing. Look at this! It's a 3D printer! That's cool. 3D printing. 
So if you want to see more, please go to <laughs> NBCLearn.com. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Maida. Thank you to all our wonderful panelists. Before I run off to, to vote, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge again RISD, uh, all the hard work in putting this together, and our wonderful speakers. I look forward to more briefings in the future and with working with all of you on how we can shape policy uh, to make sure that we have the creative innovators. I, I also wanted to mention with regard to the patent office, uh, Dr. Yang Zhao, who's a, a professor of globalization and technology at the, my alma mater, the University of Oregon, uh, talks about uh, the number of patents per capita we have here in the United States as an indication of creativity. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of work to do. I look forward to working with all of you. And again, thank you to our great speakers. And uh, thank you again, RISD. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Bonabici. Um, Yes, before I came here, I was with Rachel over there, uh, the President's uh, c uh, Committee on Arts and Humanities. And we were talking about STEAM and this question of, is there a silver bullet? And th there is no silver bullet, but we came to the fact that there's maybe a silver ray. There's a ray you can keep on shining at something important. And this gathering is an example of that kind of ray. And I want to, um, you know, it's possible to do Q&A by a thing called Twitter. So I want to note that we can have hashtag STEM to STEAM, S-T-E-M-T-O-S-T-A-M after this, so there's time for everyone to have a, a voice in that conversation. The STEAM panelists here brought so much STEAM, and I want to help to summarize some of that STEAM if I can. Um, first of all, uh, Trevor's. Uh, Trevor is a green bear problem. Let's call it the green bear problem. <laughs> it, it really isn't a problem. It's a problem that we think it's a problem. It's a problem that we think green bears are wrong. What's wrong with green bears? It's because art enables that fact to be enigma. And it's OK. It's OK. Your green bear's OK. Um, and that little factoid, Americans believe that we are a creative country, but we think that 25% of our time is spent on creative work. So what's that about? That doesn't reflect our feeling of work every day. Uh, Eric Siegel's point about taking design thinking into STEM learning. Um, I love it when you talked about the musicians in this audience. He asked, you know, musicians, you guys, you know, we musicians, we're persistent and, you know, we practice. And, and, and that's something that many people aren't aware that art is hard. Um, making art is not, even making your baskets was not easy. <laughs> <laughs> to make it well is hard. To make it is easy. Anyone can make, but not everyone can make well. And practice is required in that. Uh, design make play, you brought up. Um, that word play is a wonderful thing, but people don't realize that there's something called hard play. It's hard play because you're competing, not with your peers, but you're competing with the hardest person in the room, which is yourself. And that's the kind of play that artists engage in so much. Bill O'Brien's point, that he, he quoted Joan Shikikawa, acting director, we live in an age when the gap between art and science is narrowing, and it appears to be convening. That was lovely. You know, it appears to be convening. So it's happening in this room. Um, and um, you brought up some of your projects from the NEA about healing. And Lisa brought up a point about art as a refuge. And so art it has this powerful function that we take for granted so often. I see the speaker from the CDC who came here before, to Ed Rizdi, from the CDC to the, uh, to the uh, health symposium we had. Um, healing, art can heal. We see it through and through. Um, Joyce's point, and I'm so delighted to have Joyce speak here because I love lawyers. I love the law profession. I was, I was going to be either president of RISD or a lawyer, it turns out. So I, maybe I'll have time later, maybe. Um, but I love when she said Article 1, Section 8. What is that? What is in that? I'm going to look it up. Um, you know, I, it's, it's important. Um, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, thank you. I don't know anything. That's why I have to go to law school. Um, but I was thinking how... Um, there's, you said there are millions of definitions of innovation. And I thought about how art doesn't have the patent on innovation and creativity. Scientists have that. Everyone has that. But art has a certain license, a certain speed, a certain style that we can all learn from. I've learned so much from artists throughout my, throughout my life. And I love when you said, you can't say imagine without imagining. Isn't it true? You just say that word, it's like cream, like on a bagel or something. It's like, oh, yeah, just, I can, your mind just runs with it. Um, 
I just want to note that these panelists uh, brought so much to this gathering. I want to thank you all for that. It was uh, remarkable. And, and the steam from this audience, again, on Twitter, hashtag STEM to STEAM. Please go on there later. I want to also acknowledge people who helped to create this event. First, I want to acknowledge the RISD board members. Can you please stand up? RISD board members, Michael Allen, uh, Dick Haining, please. Megan Riley, please, thank you. And uh, Megan, Riley, Megan Riley Michaud has launched a petition. Uh, so just go on our website and sort of sign the petition for more STEM to STEAM activities in the world, in our, in our country in particular. I want to acknowledge Roseanne Summerson, our provost, and also our past provost, Jesse, Jesse Sheffron. Thank you. And all the people from Academic Affairs, Patty Pradeep, we also have Candace from HR, Jack and Ed, and also a special person, Becky Bermont, who's been leading the strategy and marketing of STEAM. Becky, where are you? Maybe she disappeared. Into there she is, Becky, thank you. Thank you. And her mom, Jane. Um, and, and, and Carly Katz, where are you, Carly? Thank you so much. Um, you've brought so much to this event on behalf of Representative Bonamachi's entire staff. This has been an amazing thing for us to do. It was going to be this big, and now it's this big, and who knows how big it really is. But thank you for that leadership. I want to thank Babette, Babette Alina, our head of government, government relations, and um, the RISD interns over there, RISD interns, the house band, uh, to make it happen. And I, forgot, I probably didn't thank someone, but I want to thank all of you over and over for choosing to take time out of your day, the most valuable thing you have in your life, to come here to stand around, stand the steam, and please keep on steaming. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone.